Coming up next on Dr. Oz, are you bigger on top or bigger on the bottom? Whatever your shape, this is the show for you. What to eat now for your body type. Boost your metabolism and whittle your waist. Simple meals customized just for you. Plus, stressed out? Relax. The five-minute meditation anyone can do almost anywhere. Coming up next on Dr. Oz. So, you want to lose weight and prevent disease? I thought so. Well, you can. It's a lot easier if you know the specific foods that work best for your body type. Where you store your fat is critical to what you should be putting on your plate. So I'm gonna show you what to eat now, today, for your body type. So let's get right to it. There are two major body types. You might recognize yourself in these. There's the bigger on top, folks. Your fat tends to migrate to your belly and above. Scientifically, you're called androids. Androids. And then there's the folks that are bigger on the bottom. In this case, your fat sort of settles downwards towards your butt and your ankles. And you're called gynoids. So androids and gynoids. Let's start with the folks who are bigger on top. Please be honest, if you want, you don't have to be. How many of you who put your hands up fall into this category? The android body category, show of hands. Let me start right over here. Ma'am, stand if you don't mind. How are you? What's your name? Hi, Denise. Denise. So how long have you been an android? Your whole life? Did no, no, actually, um, was really fit my whole life, and then uh, I turned 40, and things went downhill, and I got like this tire. I wish I could say it was a flat tire, but it's, <laughs> it's not. Um, and uh, literally in the past 10 years, I've gained 15 pounds. And I work out, yeah. and it's just you won't feel the go muscles. away. You see the muscles there? Oh, they're there for sure. All right. So, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Folks think they're born with a specific body type, and they'll have that their whole life. We actually change. Our fat distribution in particular changes as we age, and that's why we have to actually adjust what we're eating. So the things you were eating when you're 30 don't happen to work when you're 50, and certainly won't be the true when you're 70. So let's go inside the bigger on top body to see the challenges you can tackle with food. If your fat migrates north, this is what's happening inside your belly right now. The fat in your middle is sucking up high levels of cortisol, the body's key stress hormone, slowing down your metabolism, making you hardwired to pack on the pounds. As an android, you're more prone to fat wrapping around your vital organs. We need to reduce that to stave off inflammation and heart disease. And if you can trim inches off your waist, you can also decrease your chances of developing kidney problems and breast cancer. So, if you're an android, what should you be eating now for your body type? So Denise, I know you're working out, but have you had a difficult time just maintaining your weight? I mean, you mentioned 15 pounds. It's That's good a lot of weight. <laughs> And that's just by doing everything the right way. I, I think I'm doing everything the right way, but obviously I'm not because it's not working. So. Well, I think you're doing things the right way for a body type, but it may not be your body type anymore. So I want to walk you to everybody else who's having an android scenario, the fats above the waist size, to, to focus on when they're going to be eating. Now, the first thing you want to do is get more vitamin C into your body. And vitamin C is very interesting. We don't think about it in this context, but vitamin C is very important for how we manage stress. In fact, there was a, a very cool and classic paper where they looked at people who were, who were low in vitamin C. They had a much, much higher chance of having weight issues above their weight. You need that vitamin C to deal with cortisol. That's the key mm -hmm. hormone. So think about this. There's a 131% increased chance of belly fat if you're low in vitamin C. Why take a chance? So the vitamin C sources that I have for you here are pretty classic ones. Oranges are a great source, but they're not the best source. Plus, you can't eat oranges every day. So yeah, you know, there's all kinds of examples of kale, and papayas, and peppers, strawberries, broccoli, wonderful sources. You can eat them raw. Mm -hmm. I know some folks, for example, aren't gonna wanna eat their kale raw, although I like it that way. Uh, and you will get the most nutrients if it's raw, but you can get them frozen, and you can cook them up a little bit. The less you cook them, the better for maintaining the vitamin C in them. All right, so do you like any of these? I love all of these. Oh, good. Yeah. You're not gonna have any problem with vitamin C. No. All right, that's the first thing. <laughs> okay. so every meal is gonna have one of these three components. The next is the power of cold. So I might put you in an ice box, but that's not the point here. It turns out that foods are actually very different in their effect on your body, depending on what temperature they're at. So there's specific things called resistant starches. You may have heard of these before, but resistant starches, especially when they're cold, are much better for you because the carbs in those starches can't get into your bloodstream as quickly. And there are a lot of examples. Remember, temperatures change. Mm -hmm. When it's hot, it's easily digested. When it's cold, it's hard to digest them. And it actually seemed to increase your fat burning capacity about 20% if they're cold. So, for example, potatoes. We talk about potatoes a lot in the show, sometimes not in the best of, of ways, right? But potatoes are actually a wonderful source 
of resistant starch if they're cold. Uh, white beans are in that category, lentils, uh, long grain rices, uh, barley is a great source. All these, again, could be foundations of some of the meals you eat, but you're going to have to have them a little bit cold. Okay. Right. And the last little bit is how you're going to cook them. What are you going to use as an oil? And I actually happen to like this, coconut oil. It doesn't tend to get digested the way some other fats would. Uh, and two tablespoonfuls of coconut oil a day have been used in several studies and seem to shrink the waistlines of folks. Really? So again, it's a combination. I'm not giving you a mm -hmm. magical one-time solution. You've got to put these things together and make it part of your life. But I want to give you an example. If I put all these together, what your meals might look like, for example. Okay. So you could, for breakfast, uh, have some potato salad. Uh, you can go to cook this, by the way, with the coconut oil that I just mentioned. You can have an omelet with broccoli in it. Right. In this case, the, the broccoli has the vitamin C. Uh, you, you've got a great protein source with the, with the eggs, but they're really also a way of getting the coconut oil into your diet. And the, the potatoes are a resistant starch. Uh, for lunch, you can have, let's call this a, an Android salad. Would that look good in the restaurant? I'll, I'll have the Android <laughs> salad, please. We can label our foods that way by how they're good for you. So this is, awesome. it's great, isn't it? You have papaya and you know, kiwi and strawberries, things that have lots of vitamin C in them. Uh, you get some lentils, which are resistant starch. Again, you have them cold. Uh, these are things you want to eat cold. So you, know, not, you, know, you can't make soup with resistant starch and it won't work for you. Um, and then you can have, uh, along with this, put a little coconut oil in the dressing which again is pretty easy to make. Uh, and you can have, pep, you know, for dinner, right, rice stuffed pepper. Pepper's a vitamin C. The, the, uh, the rice itself could be the resistant starch. Mm -hmm. And you can use the coconut oil in the cooking. So of these three, which one do you think you'd like the most? This one. You this one? I'm gonna give you a little tip. I want you to actually taste this, because I had this for lunch today. Really? Yes, it was quite good. <laughs> Let's see if you like this. And I'm not a huge pepper eater, but when prepared this way, it actually had a, had a little, little, little bite to it. It was nice. Wow, that tastes really good. Cool. Again, I'm giving you foods that you should enjoy eating. All these recipes are on DrRoz.com. Remember, you keep it cold mm -hmm. if you're an Android person. Uh, and this way, even if your body's changing in that direction, you can nudge it back in the direction you want to go at. All right. Now, I want to talk about how gynoids a little bit. Those are the folks that have the bigger bottoms. So let's go inside your body and take a look at what changes there. If your fat migrates south, this is what's happening inside your body right now. Your body is producing excess estrogen, making you a target for water retention and bloating. Your next challenge, the fat on your bottom, is meant to be stored for future use, not to be burned easily. We want to offset that so your genes will fit better, but more importantly, you will lower your risk of diabetes. Finally, losing fat around your bottom takes pressure off your bones, so you lower your chances of painful and inflamed joints. So, if you're a gynoid, what should you eat now for your body type? Now, Jada says her fat is migrating down. So what bothers you about your body type? What bothers me, I was noticed about it yesterday. I tried to pull up my pants and I broke a nail. So I'm tired of breaking nails with, you know, with an extra... Let me see the poor nail. <laughs> you know, I'll kiss it and make oh, it better. thank you. <laughs> All right. Let me show you what you're going to eat if you're bigger on the bottom. You know, you guys beat yourselves up so much about your body shapes. Mm -hmm. And I want to make it easier for you to go in the right direction. If you eat the food that's designed for someone who's the android, the the fat up top mm -hmm. is not going to work for you. Okay. For the gynoid people have the weight on below. This is what's going to work for you. Okay. First thing, insoluble fiber at every meal. Here's why. People who are big down below have a lot of estrogen. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad thing. It's just how you made. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if you have a lot of estrogen, you're going to store fat down there. So by getting a little extra fiber into your, your life, you pull the estrogen out of your body. Wow. You don't absorb it as much so the fat doesn't settle down your hips and your bottom thing. You, know, you don't break nails anymore. Exactly. Right. Thank you. So, <laughs> the best source of insoluble fiber, I think, are to mm -hmm. fill up about a third of your plate with the classic things that we all love. Navy beans are a good source, you know, inexpensive squash, avocado, mm -hmm. eggplant. Uh, these things are fantastic to make in different directions and they're in season. And you know, you can have bread. Mm. Uh, you can have 100% wheat bread. It actually helps because it's got fiber in it to pull the estrogen out of your body. I've been running away from bread. Okay. Yeah, I'm not telling you have a lot of it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to offer some diversity into okay. it. If you're gonna have anything, have 100% whole wheat bread. Not much of it. Okay. All right. Any of these foods excite you beside the bread? The egg fried eggplant. Fried eggplant. <laughs> I'm in the wrong show. I came to the wrong show today when I came to work. Okay. <laughs> Next, I want you to eat one serving of calcium every meal. Okay. Again, lots of studies have been done on this. Calcium seems to help regulate the way fat cells take care of themselves. They actually burn themselves up a little more if you get enough calcium. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think dairy is actually valuable for folks who tend to store fat in their hips and their buttocks area. Okay. So I want you to get some dairy, get the calcium in it. I like it in yogurt, cottage cheese, uh, regular old hard cheeses also work. Any of these are fine. Almond milk? Uh, almond milk can, as you know, some of them have more calcium than others. Just okay. make sure it's got calcium in it. I'm just trying to get calcium into you. Okay. I, it doesn't matter to me how you get it there. In fact, you don't have to even use dairy at all. Nuts, which I, you know I really? love, have it. Okay. 
You know, folks don't think about this. It, you know, mushrooms have a ton of calcium, and shiitake mushrooms also have vitamin D in them. Wow. So you can get it from both those, arugula. There's many sources of calcium. Uh, just find a way of making it part of your diet. And okay. remember, you can take calcium as a pill, mm -hmm. but I'd rather you get it in food. Natural, okay. It's just because you can get it all day long that way, and you can probably get enough that way without too much difficulty. Okay. Okay, the last little bit, make sure you don't break your nails anymore, <laughs> is to make sure you get a little bit of lean meat. Okay. Now, the reason I mention that is f folks who store their fat below their waist tend to take any fat in their diet and put it down there. Mm. Whereas if you have lean protein, like lean beef, okay. you actually won't get as much fat in there. So I don't mind the protein, and I want you to enjoy life. These okay. are some great sources. Okay. You, know, you, you can get tenderloin, sirloin, flank steak, pick any kind you want, as long as it's lean. Okay. Right, and if you do that, and I know this every day, this is you know, once a week, maybe twice a week at most, little, little endeavor, but this is not gonna hurt you. Okay. Right, so if you do all this, this is an example of what your week might look like. Well, this looks good. Doesn't it look good? Yes, so I love get, avocados. But for, let's start there then. For lunch, you, you know, avocados, again, a great, a great source of fiber. I put some ground beef in the middle, so you get some of the lean beef we talked about. Uh, you also have some calcium from the arugula. Back to breakfast, I let you have the bread. Okay. Uh, you, you can get some cheese, which in the back there, you can see it, some calcium oh, right. uh, there. And, and, and over here, this is an eggplant, not the fried eggplant you were talking about it earlier. It still looks good. It does. Look. But, <laughs> but eggplant, in any way you make it, has insoluble fiber in it. It's got low-fat mozzarella on top, which gives you the calcium. Mm. So which of these you want to try? Oh, I hate I have to pick. I want all of them, but we can try the eggplant since, since we're it's trying not fried. something new. There yes. Here, I think that may, are you able to do this with a, with a broken nail? Yeah, yeah. Not a problem? Let's see. Yeah, but a little, little well, bite. Cheese. Yeah, I would take a small bite because you won't be able to talk with a big bite. Mmm. <laughs> tastes very good, Italian. Italian. I loves it. Mm -hmm. How would you compare it to fried versions of this? It's really, I don't even need fried if I can get this. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You can check out DrOz.com for more meal plans for your body type, and I'll be right back. Stress. We all have it. We all suffer from it. But almost 7 million women struggle with something more, infertility. Could anxiety be impacting your ability to have a child? Simple Ways to Conquer Your Stress is next. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner. Plus... A daytime exclusive, Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. Almost 7 million women in the U.S. struggle with infertility. Many of them are often left with more questions than answers. But now, a recent study is pointing the finger at a surprisingly important cause. One sperm, one egg. That's all it takes to make a baby. But for couples struggling with infertility, their hunt for answers is often filled with intrusive medical testing, closely examining her reproductive system and his ability to produce healthy sperm. But for some women, the answer may actually have less to do with physiology and more to do with something we have all felt, stress. In a groundbreaking new study, researchers monitored the stress hormones of 400 women who were trying to get pregnant. They found women with the highest levels of stress were 29% less likely to get pregnant. They were also twice as likely to meet the clinical definition of infertility, which is having unprotected sex for a year without becoming pregnant. Doctors have long known stress can increase your risk for heart disease, obesity, and even some forms of cancer. Now, it may even affect your ability to conceive new life. Joining me is reproductive endocrinologist from NYU Fertility Clinic, Dr. Elizabeth Fino. So what does this study say about the link between stress in our lives and infertility? You know, Dr. Oz, this is a really important study. It is the first study of its kind that is able to really demonstrate a clear link between something tangible, something scientific, a measurable stress hormone or measurable stress biomarker and time to conceive or infertility. It actually showing that that risk of infertility is almost twofold, which is huge. So that age old question of does stress impact infertility and just, oh, don't be stressed, keep trying, we can really start to get at what is actually going on. I mean, I, I know oftentimes couples try and they try, they, they're not successful trying to make a baby, and then they just stop trying and boom, 
the baby happens. It happened actually to a relative of mine. I know it also, I just found this out, Infer infertility treatment, sometimes they're unsuccessful. And in 20% of cases, when couples don't try anymore, they leave IVF efforts, they get pregnant on their own. I mean, is this the missing link? Absolutely, stress can be involved in that. I mean, I, th I think the key thing to remember is that such a large portion of patients who experience infertility have what we call unexplained infertility, which means we don't really know what the link is. And within that group of patients, there's many different factors and stress for sure is probably one of them. And you know, that's the story that everybody wants to have is I was that patient that I finally gave up and then boom, I was pregnant and the baby came. Unfortunately, we don't see that as frequently as we would like to, but it does happen. Even patients who move on to donor egg and then conceive on their own naturally after that. There's probably two things going on. One, stress is related, and two, sometimes revving up your body in a way that we do so with IVF or assisted reproduction overrides your natural stress mechanism. And while you might not conceive in that cycle, something that resets your body in a way can then lead to a natural conception. And there's a little bit of a chicken and egg issue here. Are you stressed out because you can't get pregnant? Or is it the opposite? Are you infertile because you're so stressed and you can't get there? A little bit of both. I think it's hard to say which comes first, but we know that just, you know, there are measurable, measurable impacts of stress, like erectile dysfunction in men and women losing their menses altogether because of stressful situations. On the other hand, the amount of stress that patients feel as they start to worry about, am I doing it right? Am I doing it at the right time? And really putting so much emphasis on the idea of conception just leads to heavier burden of that stress. And that can really exacerbate the underlying problem. You brought men into the conversation. So let's talk about- They the, are sort of they part, are part of the, of the equation. Half, half the problem <laughs> often time, more even. So how does a stress on a man affect infertility issues? I mean, a couple of things. I think some of the tangible things that we see are, you know, while the man is often the less talked about person in our experience, you know, on the on the treatment side, um, just natural conception, you know, you need desire and, and ability to have an erection and ability to ejaculate. So just those three basic things, if those are gone, then conception's out the window. Yeah. And women often blame themselves for the process, but when a man can't be part of the equation, part of the puzzle, uh, which oftentimes stresses uh, the hindering element, you're blaming the wrong thing. It's the stress in their lives which you ought to get to. So exactly. how long, couples out there watching right now who are having issues, how long right. should they wait before they come get attention from a doctor? It really depends. If they have no risk factors, so if they don't have any known infertility factors like fibroids or endometriosis, something like that, then really if you're under 35, it's safe to wait a year. A year is within the natural, the natural conception range. Um, over 35, recognizing the importance of reproductive aging, women really should seek out fertility, at least a fertility evaluation within three to six months of trying without conceiving. What about after age 40? After age 40, I tell patients, come right in the door. There's no sense in trying for three to six months if there is something wrong. So there's no harm in just checking your fertility, assessing a few things that can give you the go-ahead to say, okay, it's safe to try three to six months because again, that reproductive aging is so important. And the last issue that I, I've got to ask about, because we've been taking a pretty strong stance in the show about how, how you can deal with stress more effectively and, and the reality that sometimes it's hard to do. If you're so stressed out that you can't actually deal with these infertility issues, at what point do you give people medications? You know, it's a tough question. There's a lot of controversy about that, but I think more so, similar to the study that we're talking about, there's a lot of data out there on, you know, happy, healthy mom, happy, healthy baby. And that's really important to recognize. So while optimal, um, you know, optimally, we'd rather not treat patients with medications that have any risk during pregnancy. On the other hand, letting significant stress or clinically significant anxiety or depression go untreated can really have tremendous impacts on both mom and baby. In the meantime, please take advantage of all these tips. We're you know, throwing them out there all the time for stress management. It makes up. And the side effects of not dealing with this show up all the time as well. Try things like exercise, obviously, yoga, mm -hmm. acupuncture. All these things are on DrOz.com. In fact, I got a list of seven simple ways to conquer your stress. Maybe there'll be a pregnancy list as well. Be right back. Stress can have a serious impact on your health. How do you relax? I de-stress by camping or going to the beach, especially the latter. It's the best therapy in the world. Share your relaxation tips with us on Twitter with hashtag OzTips. Next, what if you could improve your life in just a few minutes a day? A five-minute meditation for anyone who wants peace in their life. Learn to manage your stress in a meaningful way. Come back into what's happening right now. Next. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner? Plus, 
A daytime exclusive, Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. What if in just five minutes a day you could alter how you handle stress in a meaningful way? Well, it can be done with mindful meditation. Now, you think meditation is not for you? Well, today I'll make you think again with a five minute meditation. Inspired by the ancient Buddhist practice of meditation, American doctors in the 1970s developed a secular version of meditation to combat stress called mindfulness meditation. The guiding principle, to learn to live in the moment. Training your brain to stop focusing on past traumas or future stresses. The technique is simple, taking a few minutes each day to concentrate on the breath and observe the sensations that arise in the body, what meditators call a mental body scan. Practitioners claim mindfulness meditation reduces stress and anxiety, and now researchers are backing them up. A new study reveals meditation can actually moderate your body's production of cortisol, so you feel less stress under pressure. Other studies show even more tangible health benefits, lower blood pressure and help with pain control. Best of all, it's easy to get started. All you need is five minutes. Now these women have never meditated before and appear to be ready to start. Are you guys ready? Well, they may have some skeptics in there, we'll find out. Corey Mascara is one of the leading experts in mindful meditation and integrative medicine. A lot of folks hear meditation and they appropriately get skeptical. They think it's about some new age, crazy religious practice. So what do you say to these skeptics? Well, here's the thing. That's one of the biggest misconceptions about mindfulness meditation. This idea that you need to be a Buddhist or that you need to subscribe to some Eastern spiritual tradition in order to practice meditation. And while it's true that mindfulness is considered the heart of Buddhist meditation, when you look at what we're doing, we're just paying attention in the present moment and being aware. And that's a capacity of mind that's available to everyone. So this practice of mindfulness is for anybody that's looking for more clarity and presence in their life and to looking, looking to come home after a long day of work and to just actually be home instead of riding the momentum of the day and worrying about all the emails that they had to take care of. And how does it materially impact on stress? A topic that we talk about but don't do much about in our lives. Right. So when we look at what causes stress, it's when our perceived uh, demands in any given moment are greater than our personal and social resources to meet those demands. Now what's key about that definition is that the perceived demands aspect is very critical um, because our perceived demands in any given moment are usually much greater than our actual demands. For instance, um, when we're in the shower in the morning, how many of us are actually in the shower? We're usually at work already, thinking about everything that we have to take care of, everything that needs to get done, mm -hmm. and causing ourselves unnecessary stress, when in reality, what's actually happening is we're just scrubbing soap on our bodies. So what the mindfulness allows us to do is to come back into what's happening right now and see that you know, we're causing so much stress just by worrying about the future. So we're gonna do some meditation. Before we start, is there kind of is there a trick to use to sort of create a ritual around this? Yeah, so a lot of people use sound. There are certain apps that you can use on your phone where it'll ring a bell for you. Uh, today I brought my own bells that we can use for the meditation and that'll settle us into the practice. Well, let's just start out. The first step, okay. we'll get their sound going, is mm -hmm. to sit upright, not uptight. Yes. So we're gonna sit on these little so cushions. We're going to sit on these cushions and we have people behind us, these fine young ladies sitting behind us and they're sitting cross-legged. The idea here is to sit upright and not uptight. So we want to be open and relaxed. You don't need to force yourself into an uncomfortable seated position where you know, you're twisting your legs in a lot of uncomfortable postures. Um, it's about being open and comfortable. So what we're doing here is fine. You see that I'm sitting upright. And you can also do this lying down on the ground. Right, so let's chime our bell. OK. Is there a best time to, to start the meditation? So I usually like to say when you feel like you have the most energy or most awake during the day um, is the best time to meditate because this practice is about falling awake, not falling asleep. So what's really important is making it a routine in your life, something like brushing your teeth, something that you could do every time you wake up in the morning or right before you go to bed. You also want us to care to be aware. Yes. 
Yeah, so this practice is about tuning into what's happening right now. Uh, it's not about clearing away our thoughts, eliminating any sort of experience. It's about tuning into the sensations, the thoughts, and the emotions that are present in this moment without trying to get rid of anything. And it's this non-judgmental awareness that we're applying to our experience. And does it matter if our eyes are open or closed? Um, we usually like to do the meditation with our eyes closed. So if we'd like to start, we yeah. can have everybody close their eyes. If we're at home, please just take two minutes. Just practice a little bit. We're going to give you a five-minute plan on the web so you won't miss anything. But just take two minutes just to taste it now. Mm -hmm. At once, sit in this nice upright position, not uptight. Right. Close your eyes. Do we visualize anything? So that's the other thing. We're not visualizing anything in mindfulness meditation. We're just tuning into what we notice in the present moment. So there might be thoughts, there might be sensations, there might be emotions, and we're not trying to clear any of it away. We're just tuning in. How do you know if you're doing it right or wrong? Yeah, so a lot of people think that you need to have this euphoric experience in order to be doing it right, right? The way I like to look at it is, imagine a river going downstream. You can either be caught up in the current of the river or you could be sitting on the bank watching the river. In mindfulness, we want to be sitting on the bank watching our experience move by. So if we're stressed, we're just watching stress and watching the experience of stress instead of caught up in stress. And the fundamental last step, if I understand correctly, is these mindful breaths. Mm, yes. Take us through this. So here's the thing. You all know how to breathe already. It, this isn't me telling you how to breathe. But we're just tuning into the sensations of the breath. So we have an in-breath. So let's all just take one in-breath. And then there's an out-breath. And all we're doing in the mindfulness is paying attention to the sensations that are present here. Without trying to manipulate the breath, without trying to make it long and deep because we think that's appropriate for meditation. It's just using the breath as an anchor for the present moment. And if folks do this, if they really earnestly start doing this five minutes a day, what kind of long-term results should they expect? Well, a lot of studies are showing reduced stress, reduced anxiety. One of the most common things I hear from parents is the ability to come home from work and actually be present for their children. Um, even if they have other things they want to do, they can look into their child's eyes and be there for those moments that they know are important in the long term. Keep your eyes closed to the commercial break. You got a full five minute program on Oz.com. Check it out and we'll be right back. Coming up, they're hard to ignore. The painful, irritating canker sore. New studies reveal the most effective way to speed the healing of one is already in your pantry. Easy home remedies anyone can use. Next. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner. Plus, a daytime exclusive. Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. It's that little nuisance inside your mouth that stings and burns and just won't go away. I'm talking about canker sores, and today I'm unveiling how to get rid of your canker sore fast. But first, I need my assistant of the day. So how about... Whoever's well, sitting in seat number 20. 20, come on down. Who's in 20? Oh, we got a winner. We have a winner. She looks happy today. She looks happy. And she puts the jacket on and she looks wonderful. How are you? <laughs> What's your name? Crystal. Crystal. Who are you sitting with up there, Crystal? <laughs> Christina, Ann, and Carol. Hi, guys. They were jumping up more than you. That's my boss. She surprised us. A... Oh, is that how you got here? What kind of work do you do? I work in training development at Wakefern. Well, thanks for being here. <laughs> you excited? Yes. All right. All right. Now, just before I brought you down here, I mentioned the word canker sore. Mm -hmm. You ever had one of those? Yeah. You think your boss gets them too? Yeah. Yeah, she does. She all do. Come on. Over. When was the last time you had one? Um, it's been years. What did it feel like? It, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's Very. And it lasts a while, I bet. Yeah. So if it's okay with that, I was going to start up by examining your mouth. <laughs> nervous? Hi, I'm nervous too. No. Okay. This is not going to hurt me at all. Okay. <laughs> I love doing this. Okay. So look up towards the sky. Ah. Oh, you're just perfect. Now let's look inside there. Oh, 
You have beautiful teeth. What are you doing? Now, I'm look, looking around in there. I am looking for canker sores. So, ah, ah. You have beautiful eyes too. Okay. All right. So your mouth looks great. There are no canker sores in there. Thank you. <laughs> so you know what triggers canker sores? No. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. Okay. We'll take a long walk down here. So it's, it's, it's triggered by stress. Okay. Does your boss ever cause stress at work? Not that boss, but okay. an old boss did. Oh, thank goodness the new boss. Thank you, new boss. All right, so menstruation does it. Okay. Nutrient problems do it. Things like B12 deficiency, folate, iron. Iron's really comes. Okay. So let me show you what happens when all that stress builds up. We obviously are in the mouth about to enter. And you're taking care of things at work or your kids or you got things like bills and you're anxious. And you finally get a chance to sit down. And guess what? You have a little bit of popcorn. Right? Wow. You like popcorn? Yes. Big popcorn, huh? Yes. All right. Let's pretend this popcorn is going into your mouth. So I'm going to go in here first. I go through the mouth. The popcorn goes into your mouth. And let's just say it rubs the cheek. And when it rubs the cheek, it causes a little bit of a sore there. That's how the canker sore starts. So now you got to come help me heal this thing. OK. All right? So come on over here. Watch your step. So usually what the body does is grab some of that tape over there, that masking tape, and put that masking tape on and peel this thing up. Try to put it back together again as best you can. That's sort of what the body tries to do. Put some more on there if you can. So the body puts a little bit of masking tape on there, and as it does that, it creates that little white sore there. Did I show you all a picture of what a canker sore looks like? Let me show you a picture of it. This, you'll, you'll see this is uh, common. This is an image of someone's mouth who has a canker sore. Ooh. That's not me. That's not you, no. <laughs> I could have made it up and said it was you, but no, that's someone else to take a picture of. So, so it looks sort of like that, right? And then guess what? Because you're a little bit stressed out, you have a little more popcorn in it, and it works worse. And soon, keep going, you gotta keep fixing this now. Put oh, some more tape oh. on there. The body keeps trying to fix this. And every time you get stressed out and try to heal this darn thing, something else gets in your mouth, a piece of popcorn, you play with it with your tongue, put some more on there. And again, every time that happens, over the course of a couple of weeks, that canker sore keeps getting bigger and bigger, and eventually you're having a hard time putting it all right. together, right? And you end up with this big white area, and it lasts a lot longer. So I got a better solution. Instead of suffering for two weeks, which is probably how long your last episode took, I want you to try something that has been shown in a recent study to really speed up recovery. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. It's called honey. Honey? Who would have thought? Pick up that honey behind you. They did this really cool study. It's got natural antioxidant properties and it beat a steroid gel in terms of how fast it allowed your, your canker sore to heal. It healed in half the time it would normally take. So put that honey on top of there. And when you put that over the wound, it heals it so perfectly and covers it so that when your body tries to scrape it off, it can't scrape anymore. Nothing to scrape on it. So it heals it really, really quickly. And I love the fact we all have it in our kitchens right now. Yes. So, can I show you exactly how to use it the right way? Yes, you can. Okay, come on over here. Maybe I'll give you that popcorn as a present. What do you think? <laughs> Would you use it at work ever? Yes. All right. So here's what they did in the study that's really cool. You take a little bit of water. It could be salt water, ideally. Okay. Take a little cotton swab. Okay. And just wash the inside of your, your mouth. Pretend you have a canker sore. Let's just okay. say it's just on the inside of your lip, for example. Some easy to place get. There, easy, there, perfect. Then, any kind of honey you want. Doesn't have to be anything special. After doing that, you're gonna take a little bit of honey on a cotton swab like this, Q-tip. There you are. Oh, that's too much. There we are. Mm -hmm. And then rub it on there. They did this three times a day. And they were able to get this thing, these sores, sores to go away in half the usual amount. And it tastes good too. Very good. All right. So what's your best memory from today? Meeting you. It was? And insistent of the God day. bless you. Thank you very, you very much. You are the best. I love you. <laughs> Krista, you are wonderful. I'll be right back. <laughs> really, I love you. Next, after her father's dangerous diagnosis, this young chef took control of the food in their home and changed her dad's diet. Something that could also help our whole family become healthier in general. The three dishes that made her dad done with diabetes. Will it work for you? Whoever said a doctor's visit isn't fun has obviously never been to the Dr. Oz show. Is that right? Make your appointment today. Go to DrOz.com and sign up for free tickets. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner. Plus, a daytime exclusive. Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow.
Haley Thomas was only seven years old when her dad was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and she immediately took action to save him. Haley took control of the food in their house and her dad's diet, and now he is done with diabetes. For as long as anyone in her family can remember, Haley Thomas has always been a prodigy in the kitchen. At the tender age of five, Haley started whipping up her family's favorite recipes. At age nine, she even started her own cooking show on YouTube. Hi, my name is Haley Thomas, and today I will be making curry shrimp lettuce wrap. But her father Hugh's diabetes diagnosis sparked a major change in Haley's recipes. Haley did her research and found the best healthy alternatives to dad's everyday unhealthy meals. The swaps in Hugh's diet saved his life. And now the entire Thomas family is eating healthier. Haley's joining me. So what worried you the most when you learned your dad had diabetes? Well, I was really shocked and I didn't want my dad to get even more sick and maybe even die. And so I wanted to make sure that there was something that could really help him that would also help our whole family become healthier in general. So nothing would happen to us either. You're only seven years old. How do you go about changing your family's diet at that ripe young age? Well, I think the most important thing was becoming informed about food in general. And when we found out the medication that he had to take to try to cure it, it sounded like it would make it even worse. So just being informed and... You're wise beyond your years. <laughs> well stated. So I've got her parents here, Haley's dad, Hugh, and her mom, Charmaine, are in the audience. So dad, I understand here that you completely reversed your diabetes. Yes, Dr. Oz, it's been awesome. I've, since we started on the new diet, I've lost 30 pounds. I've never been this active. And we're so proud of Haley. She's got the entire family involved in eating better and getting more active. Good for you. Absolutely. So I wanted to drill into this, Haley. I want to understand how you got your parents, how you got the family to eat differently. So walk me through a typical day and what you've changed and what your dad would have eaten and what now what he's getting. The first idea is a breakfast idea, which completely surprised me. Your dad used to eat what for breakfast? He would eat sugary cereals, and that dad. was his favorite. <laughs> dad. <laughs> Right. But now we're replacing it with a fruity quinoa parfait. Now we have an assortment of berries, flax seeds, chia seeds, which are great with fiber, Greek yogurt, and then the special ingredient is quinoa, which is high in protein, heart healthy, and delicious. Does quinoa go with these foods? Absolutely. Quinoa is actually really versatile, so you can do lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Yeah, a ton of protein in it as well, which is a good part of this. If you're diabetic, get off the sugar on the protein. helps a bit. All right, lunch. You got rid of those sandwiches that have all the bread with the refined yes. carbs in there, etc. So to replace the white bread and processed lunch meats, we do an eggtastic frittata, and I made this for my dad on Father's Day. And basically, it's turkey ham, um, eggs, and our special ingredient, Brussels sprouts, which are super delicious, low in fat and sodium, and high in vitamin C, Did and you, delicious. Let's see. I think the Brussels sprouts lobby is gonna hire you. <laughs> this is really good. Yeah, so it's just a fun way to incorporate different vegetables. Is it fast to make? Super easy to make. All right, and for dinner, which we make a lot of our mistakes, Yes. What did your dad used to have for dinner? So for dinner, we would do a lot of stews over lots of white rice and huge portions. And so we wanted to incorporate the flavors that we love in our house. So we do curry shrimp lettuce wraps. And these are delicious. Let's make some. Oh, I get the help now. Yeah. So basically, we have a mixture of tomato and avocado in some lemon juice. So you just add that on there. And then if you could do the honors and add the curry shrimp. I like being bossed around <laughs> by a young woman. It's, just, it's like being at home for me. And this is Jamaican curry, so we love the flavor of that, and it's a healthy is way to Is your family Jamaican? It. Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, you go back to the cultures that so many of us came from, they always had little things like this, and we forgot about them. Bringing them back, made it, I bet this worked with your dad, too. Yes, absolutely. And the lettuce wrap, replacing taco shells or tortillas, super healthy, light, and crisp. Well, you got 30 pounds off them, <laughs> and, and 30 more years I'll have to enjoy with them. Absolutely. So now, he gets to marry you off. <laughs> Watch you graduate, do all these fun things with you that otherwise may not have happened. God bless you both. Congratulations. You can find all the recipes with these dishes on DrOz.com. And Haley's book, The Supernatural Kids Cookbook, it's got all of our Haley's favorites. It's available right now. I'll be right back. <laughs> bless you, John. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner. 
Plus, a daytime exclusive. Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. All new Dr. Oz. They're supposed to kill germs and keep you safe. But are antibiotics in meat making you sick? What to look for before you shop for tonight's dinner. Plus, a daytime exclusive. Mario Lopez reveals the secret health crisis he's never talked about until now. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. I heard from my friends over at Google and they informed me that the number one health Google search so far this year was this question. How many calories are in a single banana? Who would have thought they'd be asking them any questions about bananas? The answer is that in a medium banana, about that size, 105 calories. So it's got nutrients in it. I think it's still worth it, but it does have some calories. Now, it's time for in case you missed it. A couple of things I want you to remember from today's show. First off, eat right for your body type. We talked about to lose weight and to prevent disease, you gotta know the specific foods that work best for your specific body type because where you store your fat is critical to what you put on your plate. So for example, if you're bigger on top, a lot of bigger people on top, let me see the bigger people on top hands. They know who they are, all right. So your fat migrates to your belly and above your waistline. So scientifically, you are called an android. Uh, that means you need to eat cold resistant starches like cold potato salads, because you know when the food is cooled, the resistant carbs can actually help break down belly fat. The temperature matters. Now if you're bigger on the bottom, I'm not gonna ask who they are, but I, everyone else is them. Your fat settles downwards to your butt and your legs, that means you're a gynoid. And, and that's often because you have gynecologic, you know, female hormones often lead to that. And that, in order to deal with it, you gotta eat one source of calcium at every meal. Next, if you can get rid of the canker sores faster, you'll always do it. And there's a new study that reveals the most effective way to speed the healing of canker sores is with honey. It's an old remedy and it really does work. It has natural antioxidant properties. It beats us to the steroid gel that doctors usually recommend. It works in half the time and it's honey. Use 100% honey, any brand's fine. Apply a small amount to canker sores with a cotton swab three times a day uh, and it'll help you out. Finally, let me close with a warning. Please be careful about what you buy online, especially weight loss pills. There's some dubious people online that prey on folks like you who are trying to do the right thing for your health. Sometimes they even make it seem like I'm endorsing their products, which I don't. To see a full list of our trusted sponsorship partners, you can go to DrOz.com, and I'll see you all next time.